When I was a sophomore in high school, I got my license. It was the best day of my life. Not many sophomores at my school had their license yet, so I felt on top of the world. I was the best of the best, the elite. I drove myself to school in my 96 Toyota Camry station wagon. Uh, its nickname was the hearse for obvious reason. And, and as you can tell from just looking at the car, it was a speed demon, zero to 60 in like five minutes, crazy quick on the road. My sophomore year, I also had a girlfriend, meaning that I had to go to every dance and plan the best activities, you know how it goes. Our group decided to go to Sedona for our day activity and, and go on this hike, all to take some pictures in front of a rock that would later get deleted from Instagram because that's how relationships work when you're a sophomore. On our way to Sedona, we were cruising in the hearse, listening to whatever top radio hit was back in 2015, living life. Now, I didn't realize there was this huge downhill section on your way up, and if you're not careful, you can get going crazy fast down this thing. Me, just recently getting my license and also not really paying attention in science class, somehow missing the section on how gravity works, completely ignored this massive downhill I was going down. I finally remembered how gravity works about three-fourths of the way down the hill and hit my brakes that worked oh so well in my 96 station wagon with 150,000 miles on it and eventually got my speed down to 85 by the time I hit the bottom where the speed limit was 65 and the shiny highway patrol car was waiting for me. Shortly after, I uh, looked in my rear view and see the famous red and blue lights. So I pull over to the side of the road, the officer comes up to my window and says, do you know how fast you were going? If you have never been pulled over, I'll let you in on something. The officer usually asks, do you know why I'm pulling you over? If they skip straight to, do you know how fast you were going? You know you messed up. I reply saying some stupid number like 65 and he said, well, the middle of the hill you were pushing 95, but then you slowed down to about 85. Now mind you, anything above 20 is considered criminal speeding. So I explained to him that this is my first time driving over here. I had just gotten my license. You know, the usual excuse you would use. Gave him my license and registration and he went back to his car. He came back and said, son, I could charge you for criminal speeding, but I'm gonna let this one slide. Just pay more attention where you're at next time. And he walked off. Yes, this is a funny story. And yes, I did tell you this so you could laugh at both me and my car back in high school. But I wanna point out one thing that that officer did, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. That officer showed me grace. He could have charged me for criminal speeding and I probably would have lost my license, but instead he showed me forgiveness when I didn't deserve it. And we've all been here. It might have not been on the side of the road in Sedona, but we've all experienced forgiveness when we didn't deserve it. It may have come from parents, from friends, from teachers, We've all been there. And it's this interesting feeling. I was left with this feeling, relieved that I didn't get a ticket, yet I knew I had messed up. I was left with this experience, and yet a couple of years later, I would get pulled over for the same thing. Now, this is a fun example of a really real thing we experience daily. We experience this, this forgiveness that we don't deserve, yet still find ourselves in the same situations that caused that unworthy forgiveness in the first place. Last week, Court kicked us off and we began to read Paul's letters to the Ephesians. Courtney left us with this challenge to not normalize, to not become numb to, to Jesus' death on the cross, but to embrace the news that makes us new. We're going to pick up back in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 and talk about this idea of grace. Read with me in verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are dis disobedient. I'm dead? What the heck is a transgression? Paul, what are you talking about here? Now we all know we're not physically dead. If you are, you should probably go see somebody about that. But what Paul is referring to here is spiritual death. See, in Genesis 2, God takes Adam on a tour of the Garden of Eden, showing him all it has to offer. He then stops Adam at the forbidden, forbidden tree and says, But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. We all know what happens next. The fruit was eaten and sin entered the world, breaking the perfection of God's creation. And at that point, humans became spiritually dead. 
So what Paul is saying here is that when we choose to live in this life of sin, we become spiritually dead. When we choose to live a life that follows the ways of this world, meaning choosing what society says is good in life, or choosing what ourselves we think is the ideal way of living, we become dead inside. Death is a heavy word. Paul used this word on purpose to inflict some emotion inside of us when we read this. When you think about death, you think about a soul leaving a body and becoming empty. And when we choose this worldly life full of sin and transgression, we become empty inside. But there's always hope. Paul reminds us that Jesus, the one who brings the dead to life, is at work in us. Jesus is consistently pushing us back to him because he loves us that much. Paul continues by saying, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest were by nature deserving of wrath. It's really easy for us to, when we talk about sin, to isolate ourselves and think to ourselves that we're really the only ones struggling with sin. But I'm here to tell you that's not the case. We've all chosen this life of sin at some point in time and we will continue to choose it. It's our human nature to chase after our fleshly desires. It's a constant fight we struggle with every day. We see this play out in scripture and, and in the life of all humanity. We find ourselves in this cycle of loving God really, really well and just on fire for him. That fire starts to fade and we see us start to slip up on some things. Then we end up flat out disobeying God, finding ourselves far away from where we originally started in this cycle. I consistently find myself in this cycle and the reason being is because I'm human. It's my nature. And it might be hard to say this to yourself, so I'll say it for you. It's because I love you, but I'm willing to bet you're in this cycle too. But this cycle has been broken. We don't need to be stuck in our spiritual deaths. Listen to what Paul says happens. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show us his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Wow. Let that sink in for a second. Because God loves us so much, he sent his son so that we, not just some of us, but all of us, can be alive in our mistakes. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 again. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We no longer have to chase the worldly things that leave us nothing but empty because of Jesus. We no longer have to be stuck in our spiritual death because of Jesus. But how? How does Jesus love me after what I did? I messed up. I'm too far gone. These are the thoughts that begin to come into our head when we start talking about sin. All this baggage we have accumulated. How does Jesus love me after that? How does Jesus love me after I have broken relationships with my parents? How does Jesus love me after I have had sex before marriage? How does Jesus love me through my porn addiction, my drug addiction, my drinking addiction? My friends don't love me because of these things. My family doesn't love me because of these things. How does Jesus love me through these things? It's grace, for it is by grace you have been saved. See, grace is a characteristic of God we first hear about in Exodus 34. Moses says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. But what is it? How does this one thing save me from all of that? To have grace or to be gracious is to be kind, merciful, forgiving, or compassionate. The context of the verse I just shared with you from Exodus is really important here. God had just freed the Israelites from slavery, brought them to safety, and made this really important promise to them. And kid you not, the very first thing they decide to do is build an idol statue, breaking two of the rules that were just established in that really important promise, and worship it instead of God. This is laughable, right? Like I read this and think to myself, how would you ever mess up that bad? But remember that cycle I was talking about? That cycle of lying we fi find ourselves in? The cycle of impurity we find ourselves in? The cycle we f of sin we find ourselves in time and time again? We're the Israelites. We receive these amazing gifts from God day in and day out, but still choose to go with what we think is right. But God's response to the Israelites is the same response we get from him today. It's grace. That's it. 
God loves us so much that whenever we sin, whenever we choose ourselves, he will always respond with kindness, mercifulness, forgiveness, compassion. It is our gift from God. Verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Again, it is by grace that we have been saved from our sins. Paul repeats that on purpose. Whenever we see something in writing repeated, it is because a certain, that certain thing is important. It's worth saying again, for it is by grace you have been saved. But Paul adds something this time. He says, not by works so that no one can boast. See, grace is a gift from God. It's not something that we earn by doing good in the world. The amount of times you go to church every year doesn't get you more grace. The amount of serving opportunities you take doesn't get you more grace. The less you cuss doesn't get you more grace. It's a relationship with God that gets you grace. It's coming to God with your baggage and asking for help with it all that gets you grace. Paul said it, but we are God's handiwork. We are created in his image and loved by him no matter how far away we go. He wants to help. We know God wants to help because he sent his son down to cover us. When we don't take our struggles to Jesus, when we try to fix it ourselves, we neglect the amazing gift of grace God is more than willing to give us. There's a song on one of my favorite albums ever made by Mumford & Sons called Roll Away Your Stone, and some of my favorite lyrics on that song are this. It seems that all my bridges have been burned, but you say that's exactly how this grace thing works. It's not the long walk home that will change this heart, but it's the welcome I receive with the restart. I love that this song describes this feeling of isolation we find ourselves in when we have sinned and received this forgiveness that we have never deserved. We hear it a lot in terms of relationships. I've burned bridges with a certain person, therefore I cannot go back to that person. The song then just starts talking about this long walk home. It's talking about that cycle we touched on. Oftentimes we find ourselves really, really far away from God, so far that it may seem too far at times. And it takes a while for us to get back to the point where we once were at with God. It's a long walk, yet God's grace is waiting to welcome you back with open arms and an open heart. CSM, what cycle of sin do you need to step out of? Where do you need to let Jesus bring you out of the spiritual death that you were in? God is waiting for you. That grace is here, that grace you don't deserve, that forgiveness that has never been about earning, simply receiving, it's there. It's waiting. The brokenness is no longer holding us back. The addiction is no longer holding us back. Nothing is holding us back. The undeserving forgiveness that God continues to pour out to us is here. It's waiting. We have been saved through faith in Jesus. And that's it. That's exactly how this grace thing works.